Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome again. We've got a, another oil painting demonstration on tap for today. Um, my name is Mike Southern, and um, I've been doing uh, doing these for a few uh, for about a month and a half now, and uh, we're getting a lot of work done, covering a lot of ground. Um, this one is this one is a really fun one. Um, and I've, I've kind of uh, decided that I'm, I'm going to make the format slightly different based on we've had some people who've been returning, which is awesome. Um, and I'd like to devote a little bit of time towards the end of the class, maybe the last 15 or 20 minutes um, to answer questions about previous um, paintings and projects we've done. Um, and they can be really from any uh, any of the, the different classes that we've done. It's probably best if they're, if they're oil painting related. So the last few, um, because I don't really have everything set up in one place where I can get to the watercolor stuff and the acrylics and stuff. Um, but I've done a, a couple of projects now with oil painting. So if you wanna ask questions about those, um, I will also uh, bring those out and um, have a, a little addition to those if, if we have time. Um, to sort of continue the progress on, on previous paintings that we've done. So that's kind of what we're, uh, we're on tap for today. Um, as always, if you have questions, uh, please type them in the chat and then they will be uh, read to me and I can uh, sort of get the interchange going that way. And I, I really encourage you to do that because that's a big part of, of how this works. All right, so let's get right into it with uh, checking our supplies. So like I said, we're working with oils today. Um, and I've got my sort of usual palette of white and a couple of earth tones, ochre and raw umber, and then your three primaries, blue, red, and yellow. Um, I put down ultramarine, cadmium red, and cadmium yellow. I'm actually not using those exact colors, um, but I am using a bright yellow, a bright red, and a bright, a bright blue. So obviously it doesn't matter exactly what they are. Um, so uh, pick the one that you have and uh, do your best with that. Um, uh, another thing that's on here that's pretty important uh, to try, and especially today, I'm gonna use this uh, fairly heavily, is the uh, Windsor Newton Liquin, which is an oil painting medium, um, and also some linseed oil. If you don't have both of those, you can use either or. If you don't have either of them, you don't need them per se, um, but it will help today with, with what we're gonna do. Um, and then, of course, your brushes are going to be important. Having some paper towels um, on hand is great. If you have a really good studio setup, um, and I know I've seen some as we've looked at work in previous uh, demos, uh, you can probably use some uh, odorless mineral spirits, uh, turpentine type, type stuff. But if you're doing this on your kitchen table, um, probably not the best stuff to use because it does stink and it is not particularly healthy for you. Um, so that's our supplies. All right, so let's go to our scene. Now I have essentially nothing right here because I wanna kind of start from scratch today. Um, and I want to, uh, I'm just gonna use in the beginning, I'm gonna use raw umber. So if you wanna get that out, um, you can get that prepared, but I'm gonna do a little uh, preparation of um, my materials here. The, the medium that, or not the medium, but the, the surface I've been using has been canvas um, in the past. I'm actually gonna switch gears today. Um, I'm not gonna use canvas, the, but this is canvas and this is the way I've been staining it. Um, this is a nine by 12 sheet. You can't see the whole thing because I'm gonna work a little bit smaller on the other ones. Um, but we're gonna make a little bit of transition today. You can work on canvas for this if that's all you have, um, but I am going to work on um, wood panels today. And, and there's many different types of wood that you can use. This is like an MDF board, which is like a particle board. It's really smooth. Um, and it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not like a plywood where it's got the, the wood grain built into it. I like to use these because they're really cheap. Um, they're actually really durable. Um, and they're super easy to find. You can get these at like any lumber yard. Um, so, you know, feel free to kind of use what you have. Um, and, but if you do have some, um, some wood panels, I'm gonna kind of prep this one uh, from the ground up to show you how to kind of prepare them to be painted on. 
I've got it all laid out. So it's, you know, we're not going to be watching paint dry or anything like that, which can be a little tedious. Um, but this is one type of, of board that I have. Um, this is another kind, this is the back side. Uh, this is kind of really textured, but the other side, this is thinner. You can see that the difference here between these two. So this is, this is, I don't know, an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch. Um, this is more like half an inch. Um, I like to use, if I can get away with it, especially when it's small, uh, like I'm working with today, I like to use the thicker ones. Um, they're just, they're just a little bit more durable. For bigger paintings, um, I'll use the thinner ones because it's a matter of weight and I often have to frame them or put them on a wall or something like that. Um, so I like to use the thinner, uh, the thinner stock um, when it comes to wood. But wood panel or wood panels, uh, plywood panels work great. Birch is a particularly good, birch plywood is a really good uh, surface to paint on, fairly cheap, uh, easy to find, um, and very durable. Um, but I'm going to be using these these uh, these panels, the particle board panels. So that's what I've got here. Now, so Mike, yep, go for it. We have a couple of um, questions here. Yep. Um, here. So um, someone says that um, the they've they, they've heard of um, cardboard being able to be used if prepared with enough enough um, gesso. So yep. would that work for oils as well? Um, it would. The I, I would be hesitant to use cardboard. Um, one, because you can bend cardboard with your hands really easily. So it's not terribly durable, um, but I don't see why you couldn't do it. You would definitely have to treat it the way I'm gonna treat this board actually. So if you're using cardboard or thinking of using cardboard, um, what I'm gonna do here is actually what I would do if I was gonna use cardboard. I, I would I, I would use it if you if you're just doing it to practice and studies, but you know, if you want to give it away and frame it and things like that, it's probably not the best stuff to use. Um, you might have to uh, like mount it on board, like glue it onto a board later for, for it to be a little bit more durable. But it could be used. Yeah. Okay. What about Bristol paper? What kind of paper? Just regular paper? Bristol smooth paper. Bristol smooth paper. Yeah, that's that's a it depends upon how heavy of a stock it is. Um, like a regular um you know just a piece of paper out of a regular sketchbook i would probably not use but i paint on paper actually frequently i tend to use um heavier stock like watercolor stock like 140 pound um so it's it's uh i've actually got a piece here if i can find it let me check really quick um it's just a little bit um heavier grade and i can't oh there it is I'll just show you the watercolor paper that I have. Um, so if you remember this from a few days ago, um, this is the this is watercolor stock paper. So it's you can see that it's it's a little bit um, more uh, stocky than just your your sort of random uh, sketchbook paper. So that would work. There goes the mic here. Yeah. That's right. I'll just keep talking when I'm not really doing much anyways. Um, okay. But yeah, I would just say um, BFK, uh, Reeves BFK paper, um, Reeves R-I-V-E-S, and then it's BFK, just the three letters. Um, that one is one that I use all the time for, for preparing for paintings. Um, anything that's got that heavy weight to it is, is really the key. But yeah, paper works great. And it's it's a really pretty common substrate. Okay, and would you um, gesso it? Like for example, yep. watercolor yep. paper, you would? Okay. I'm actually gonna show you exactly how to do that. That's the first thing I wanted to show you Perfect. today. So that's a great question to ask because that's what I'm gonna show you. So I have this MDF board. The first thing that I do is I put a layer of um, the gel medium. Remember this from acrylics class we did a few few uh, weeks ago? This slow drying gel medium, just gel medium. Acrylic gel medium will work fine. And what I do, I've already done this, is I just put a nice even coat over it and it kind of seeps in there. And what that does is it seals the wood from the outside world. And 
if this were the thinner piece of wood, you know, like that, that previous one that I showed you was really thin, I would actually do that on both sides because what you don't want to do is you, want, you don't want to have moisture coming in from one side and not coming in from another. That tends to make the, the board a thin board like that bow. So do that on both sides and on the sides um, and you should be good to go. This one is thick enough where it's not really going to have that problem. So I've only, I haven't done anything on this side. So I've just put this gel medium on here first and then you just take gesso, acrylic gesso, like so. And you're just going to put a coat of this on once this is dried. And this usually only takes about 15, 20, half hour, something like that to dry. I put it in the sun. It takes a, a lot shorter amount of time when you do that. And then I got a nice big brush, relatively speaking to the board. If I were doing a massive painting, like, you know, four by six feet or something like that, I'd probably use a house painting brush. And all you're going to do is just make a nice even coat over the whole thing. I like to work in multiple directions so that the um, grain of the mark is not, you know, prevailing in one direction or another. I kind of like to have, get that center there. I like to have a little bit of kind of cross tooth to it. I'm just kind of going this way and then going this way. Try and make it fairly even. And you would do the sides as well. I won't bore you with the entire process, but I just wanted to sort of have you see one. Where you do it in multiple directions here. And so, Mike, for um, a canvas, would you have to do this as well? Um, the medium? Yeah. I mean, the. The previous stage that I that I talked about the doing uh, the gel medium, um, you could probably get away without doing that. Um, I do it on mine because I think it helps with the longevity of the painting. Um, because what you don't want to happen is you do not want that oil, uh, especially oil painting. You don't want that to get in to whatever material you're painting on, whether it's paper, whether it's board like this or um, canvas. So treating it, treating it with that gel medium will ensure that nothing gets in there. If you do four or five coats of gesso, you probably don't need to worry about that. Um, so you could probably get away. And I, I have for years, painted on surfaces where I've only put gesso on, not that, not the gel medium. Um, so, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's, it's you know, your, your painting's not gonna explode or you know, you're not gonna have a, a horrible accent. I'm not gonna paint the other two sides because that's very boring. Um, but you, you wanna make sure if at all possible that you've got the, the surface that you're painting on um, sealed off from the oil paint. And that gel medium will ensure that that happens. So this is just one coat here. Um, and that is probably not enough. You can see how it's kind of streaky. It's like a little darker here and a little lighter here. Um, I would put at least two coats on. Um, so, you know, you, you've got you to sort of play it by eye instead of ear um, because you don't you know you don't you don't want it not sealing the 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 uh, whatever you're painting it on the the substrate um, and you also want a fairly even surface to paint on yeah this is much whiter here and a little bit darker here um, this one right here uh, which one is it I think it's this one this one here this has been painted twice I'm gonna have to ship these out do a little, there we go. And I'm just gonna go put this right over in my little sunny spot. Trust me, it's sunny. This one has two coats on and I've sanded it. Um, and, and I sanded it with uh, like a 200 grit. Um, let me just sort of go out. Oh, I'm gonna go this way, that one. So this one's a little bit bigger. I'll just expand out here. Um, 
And this one has two coats and it's been sanded. And you can see how much more uniform it is. It's, uh, it's a nice smooth uh, surface. It's got a little bit of streaking here. I'll show, I'll show you, you can kind of go like that. There's a little bit of streakiness to it. That's totally fine. Um, there's a little, little something there that I could maybe, if I wanted to, I could touch up. I'm not, well, actually I will, cause I'm not gonna use this one. So I'll just, you know, maybe after a couple coats, I'll, I'll come back and kind of do a little touch up just to make sure that it's all sealed up. So this might be the last thing that I do. Any, any, any sort of um, spots that need a little bit of fine tuning, I'll do that. And then when I'm done with all of this, uh, that's when I sand it. And, and I just sand it with sort of regular, um, regular old sandpaper, probably about 200 to 320 grit, something like that. Give it a nice smooth surface um, and, and you're ready to, and you're pretty much ready to go unless you want to stain it. Did you have a, was there a question there? I thought a I couple of questions. Um, yeah, yeah, can, can um, so one is, can the sealer be airbrushed on? And also how long do you wait between coats? Ooh, wait between, well, you gotta wait till it's dry. Um, a, a coat of gesso usually takes uh, about a half hour to dry entirely. Um, so, you know, you've got to, you got to wait a little bit. I, I usually have a day where I'm like, okay, today is my preparing panels day. And I'll, I'll, I'll get like 20 or 30 of them out and just sort of production row it. So I've got a whole bunch done. And I do that once every six months or so. And that's usually enough to kind of get me through, um, you know, a, a long stretch of, of painting. Uh, pretty frequently. So um, I, I don't do it every day. It's not something I like to do, um, but you, you, you do have to set some time for it. And I'm sorry, what was the other question? I heard, I heard something about an airbrushing thing. What was that question? Yes. Um, can you airbrush the sealer on? Um, I honestly don't know. I don't know how it would, I would worry that it might, because it's like, it's basically just liquid uh, plastic. I'd be worried that it might clog up the, the spray nozzle, um, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. As long as you have a way to kind of clean it out and flush it out, it should work. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Good. All right. Um, all right, so that's, that's preparing a panel. And what I wanna do today, the, the painting part that I wanna do today is actually fairly, um, fairly quick but I need to go rinse this off because this is acrylic. This is a pretty key component. And so one thing I didn't really prepare for, um, but you don't want to have this sit on here because once this dries, um, because it is a, a polymer thing, it's really going to be hard to use it again. So I'm just going to go rinse this off or put it in a, a thing really quick. So bear with me, it won't be long. Uh, all right. set it in the jar in the sink. Hopefully nobody thinks that's a glass of milk. That's not very good. Okay, so what I do have is I have a panel that is all prepared, all ready to go. And I'm gonna move in a little bit here because that's pretty, that's pretty far away, relatively speaking. There we go, that's better. A little bit too much. And uh, Mike, would um, gessoed canvas work as well for this? It will. It will. It's not. It's not as good for for the way I'm going to be working. Um, but you, I've done it before, and it does work. Perfect. Okay. So let's get that. There we go. That seems about right. So I've got my panel, which is nice and rigid, nice and smooth, which is a big difference between canvas. Canvas tends to give a little bit more. Uh, it tends to have a little more texture. So that's what we're going to do. And what I'm going to work with today is I am going to um, really concentrate on kind of making uh, one an imagined uh, painting, meaning I'm not working from a reference. I'm just sort of doing these out of my head. I've been doing these types of paintings. This is, this is actually what I'm going to show you is kind of the first type of painting I made in oils way back when. And I'm gonna use um, some medium. So this is a mix between the two. This is half linseed oil 
and then half of liquid, 50-50. This is pure liquid, Windsor Newton product, and then the linseed oil are mixed together. And this is what I'm using. And I'm just gonna take a little bit of medium, pull a little bit of paint in here, and I'm just gonna color the entire painting this way. Because I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work reductively. And what that means is I, I'm gonna put all the paint on first and then kind of take away. At least that's the way I'm gonna start. So I'm using a nice big flat brush for this just to get a nice even coat. Um, fair amount of pigment. This is probably 20% um, medium and 80% paint. Um, you could probably do this without medium because you know oil paint is it's got it's got the oil in it already. And it's just a matter of kind of getting a nice smooth um, coat on here first off. All right, almost done. There we go. Now, doesn't look like much, does it? It's like a brown piece of wood. But I'm going to make a landscape out of this. You could. I guess conceivably do anything, but I'm going to go with landscape because that's what I'm familiar with and what I like to do. And my my supplemental tools here. This is also if you read the description. This is uh, about using kind of alternate uh, tools for making marks. I've got to hear you know I got my old Costco card, an old uh, healthcare card, a little credit card type things. I've also got some. This is. Uh, Mat board, which you use to kind of uh, frame, you know, make a little mat for like if you had a little picture and that you want to put in a frame, you cut it out of this stuff. Um, it's, I don't know, maybe a quarter of an inch thick, something like that. These are great. I'm going to make a, a, a horizon line here with some mountains. Uh, and these are awesome for this. So I'm going to get one that's, that's the right size, first off, which is, this looks to be about good. And um, I've got my little bridge here somewhere. A bridge you will see in a second is, I can find it. Oh well, I don't really need it. They're kind of cool to have. It's just a little piece of wood that kind of forms a bridge over here, but I'll just be careful and work in here. So I'm going to make um, a horizon line. All right, so I have an instant horizon line. If I don't like the line that I make, and I actually don't really like this one, um, I can just add a little bit more. Maybe I'll try another one. I'll just show you a few. I like the general idea of where I had it, but maybe I'll get a little bit. Well, my hand is blocking me. You can't really see. see. Eh. Go like that. Just kind of pushing the pushing the oil around a little bit here. Um, the other thing that you can do, uh, yeah, I guess that works all right. And now it's just a matter of just kind of playing with it until something interesting happens. Um, I think I'll make a little path or stream in as well. And I'm just gonna take a smaller one here, maybe put this in. Something like that and firm this up a little bit, something like so. Now I'm just gonna get a little bit more paint on here and maybe just add a little bit of 
dark ridge of trees here. These are kind of moody landscapes. When I started making these, I was I was in the Pacific Northwest near um, in Oregon, and there's a lot of kind of in Eastern Oregon. There's a lot of sort of dry, high desert areas, and this was kind of what was happening there. And I'm just going to take a little bit of this and maybe you know add the hint of some chaparral or maybe a fence post, something like that, who knows? Little, let me get a little closer here. I'll get in. So, there, I can see that a little bit better. There we go. Now just making kind of some random marks. And this, this is exactly how this is exactly how I build these up is I just kind of make make little marks until it kind of gets interesting. And there'll be there'll be in, instances where I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure about that one. You can just kind of bring bring in some paint again. Um, let's try. And you can use the brush. You can use. I actually haven't used these yet. And I'll use the little credit card here. So, you know, I've got the paint down. Kind of like that. That seems pretty good. And I'm just, I'm just reducing the amount of paint, thus the name reductive painting. Don't really like that, so I'll just, just kind of bring it bring it back. Maybe add a like a dark little cloud coming in, something like that. A little rain, hint of rain coming across there. A lot of weather moving across this country out there in the east, eastern plains of the Pacific Northwest, Something like that. Maybe hint at it's kind of hidden behind a little bit of a, a ridge over there. Maybe add a little. I, I might. I might at times use um, a little black to even get some darker, uh, darker values in here. But it's usually a really simple palette. And I, I, I kind of want to show you. I'm not, I don't kind of want to show you. I, I, I do want to show you, and I will show you um, where I go from here with these, because by the time. Um, I've got one that I like. I don't really like to add a lot more than just this coat um, because if I try to add too much paint, it kind of, it kind of loses a little bit of the, the looseness and the spontaneity of it. Mike, we lost video again. Oh, yeah. oh. Hey, are. it came back. Wow, look at that. There we go. Let's bottle that and try that for next time. Usually I have to fiddle with it. Uh, maybe a little sort of distant cloud line, and because this um, because this paint is so um, fluid, I'm I'm really able to get a lot of nice uh, sort of blending and moving around of of the paint here. So it it really is a, a pretty flexible state, and this is this to me is is one of the great things about oils is because because it's so um, slow drying, 
um, I, I'm really able to kind of just play with it, you know, really get um, really get a lot of mileage out of my marks. And, you know, oh, I don't really like, I don't really like that. So I'll take my rag here and try a little bit of, of this kind of mark making. Kind of scuff this out a little bit more. Add a little bit of that more rough kind of approach. Maybe add a little hint of, you know, texture into there. Maybe add a little hint of a brushy. Oh, missed that one. Do that again. Something like that. All right. So here, I'm gonna just give you a little close up view here, a little bit closer view. Um, so this, this is the overall, let's get that back a little bit. There we go. So that's, that's the entire thing. And then if you get up close, there's an artist in Oregon where I used to live. Um, his name is James Lavador. And he used to make paintings. He did paintings like this. Um, and I stumbled on his paintings after I started messing around kind of like this. And I'm like, oh, he's making the paintings that I want to make. Um, and he really has some lovely works along these lines. So um, if you want to look at somebody else uh, who's doing, doing this and has been doing it longer than I have, uh, James Lavador um, is somebody who can go do a quick Google search and you'll, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but his paint, his paintings can look almost photorealistic with the amount of apparent detail he gets in here um, with all these small little marks. So this is a, a really wonderful way to kind of get a lot of mileage out of your mark making. I'm just going to move this down a little bit here. So yeah, there we go. So that gives you a, a, an idea of how how really easy it is to, to get some really nice texture in here. I mean, this, this painting took me maybe 15 minutes. And, and what I will do with these is I'll just have them kind of lined up and I'll do like five or 10 of them at once. And then just, then just let them sit overnight or over the course of a week or whatever, let them dry and then I'll be ready to kind of work on the next stage. So I'll show you a few of these here. I kind of got to widen we, out. We do have a question here. Um, do you yeah. ever use more than one color? And if so, how do you do it? Yes, um, I usually do more than one color, um, but, and I'm gonna show you a few examples of that. So this is one here that I did that is now dry. It's totally dry. Um, it's it's got some scuffs on it and I don't know how they got on there, but that, that's fine. Um, and what I'll do now, and actually I may do this with, with an, another one that I have over here, it's smaller. But once I, once I have this dried, then I'm gonna come over top of it with other colors. I, I don't often do, um, you know, like on this one, I probably wouldn't do any other colors at this stage. I have before. Um, but I just like the results better if I kind of wait for it to dry and then just do layers on top of it. But there's absolutely nothing keeping me from coming in here um, and doing, you know, some blue sky or, you know, red middle ground or something like that if I wanted to. I just feel like I don't have quite as much control over it when everything's wet like that. So I like to, to wait, wait till it's dry and then start adding um, some layers on there. And um, this is one here that I'm going to use as, as kind of step two. This is one that's dry. Um, it's obviously much smaller than that last one. So I'm going to have to hone in on this a little bit. And this one has, has dried. And it's also... Um, like right in here, if you look through here, there's kind of this little glowy area to it. Um, that is 
uh, what's called a scumble. And a scumble, if you remember from previous classes, is when you put a lighter color over top of darker stuff. So this is a lot of white. Um, and what I'm gonna do here is I'm just going to, I'm gonna take my brush that I use because it's a nice size for what we're doing. Just gonna clean out a little bit of the brown in there. Not all of it, because brown's not a horrible thing. Um, and I'm just gonna take a little yellow ochre. This is pretty red. Um, so I'm gonna kind of soften it up with a little bit of a yellow ochre glaze. So I'll take a little bit of that, take some of my medium and just a nice, just to change the overall color slightly. And also to get that surface kind of back into that slippery area, which I, I like to, for these to be in. So certain areas, get a little bit more pigment, certain areas, maybe a little bit more medium, but trying to make it somewhat uniform. So it's a real subtle, you're probably, you're probably not noticing exactly how much change is going on, but it, it does, you can see it better in, in there. That's a better angle, let's try that. You kind of see how it, that yellow kind of integrates into that a little bit better. So once again, this is kind of indirect painting in that a previous layer dries and then you add another layer over top of it. And now I think you're gonna see pretty quickly here, the change that's gonna happen when I add a little bit of white into this. And then once I do this, I, I really like to open it up for questions about um, previous paintings that we've had and you know, anything else that comes up. Cause I, I feel like the last few times there've been some great questions and I really haven't been able to devote a ton of time to them. So if you're thinking of something, um, you know, maybe write it down or, or just remember it and, uh, and feel free to kind of ask um, as, we, uh, as we get into that sort of question and answer. I'm just putting a few more colors out here. I'm putting another blue uh, sort of that primary blue up next to my um, brown right up there. So I've got those two colors. I'm going to make a dark out of that. So I'm just going to concentrate on, on light and dark. If I want, let's just say I wanted to make this foreground here a, a little bit uh, bolder red or something like that, that really stands out. I can just take a, a little bit of my, my red. I'll do that first. We'll, we'll just start with that. Let's take a little bit of red maybe get a smaller brush since I'm working in a smaller area. So something like this, it's maybe like a third the size of that one that I use. And I'm actually not gonna use any, any medium here. I'm just gonna take a little bit and try to get a fairly even bead on here. And then just really warm this foreground area up. And this is a nice big bold you know, color that's gonna pop out. And when you're dealing with landscape, um, you know, it's, it's often, oftentimes, you know, the sense of space, like if I put this out in the back, that might be a little bit, it might serve to flatten things out. So I want that nice bold color to be in the foreground. Um, and what I can do sort of piggybacking on that is, is take some of this, I just left the red in there and then I'm gonna mix up an even darker color and again, not using any medium because I've already got a fair amount of medium all over the surface anyway. And I'm just gonna kind of amplify some of the darks. Just give myself a little bit bolder foreground darks. Contrast, bright colors, those things all tend to work best in a foreground, especially in a landscape situation. So still working fairly thinly. Just trying to work around that bright red mark that I've made. Maybe put a little bit in here. 
your sense of contrast. And, you know, you, you probably can't notice it, but because of the, of the blue that was in here with that yellow, there's sort of this nice subtle green that's coming out here from that yellow ochre glaze that I put in. So you're, you're seeing how the previous layers um, kind of inform what you've already put down. They're mixing, in other words. And I'm gonna make this cloud up here a little bit darker as well. And then I'm just gonna do a nice scumble. So it's really getting moody here. And I can, I, you know, can add that distant hint of weather coming in. Maybe throw a little, is that smoke? Is it a cloud? Who knows? All right, well, that looks pretty good. Bad day on the range. Looks pretty, looks pretty ominous. So I'm gonna get another brush. It's sort of in between the two that I've used. And um, I'm going to uh, make that scumble like I was telling you about. I'm just gonna move my palette here so you can see what I'm doing. So my little bit of white down here in the bottom. Let's just move that down. There we go. That'll do it. And I'm just going to take this. And I'm just going to use straight up, straight white, allowing what's already here to kind of uh, warm up my warm up my white. And what this does is it kind of you know hints at. Um, a little brightness on the horizon out there in the distance, something like that. Maybe kind of define that, that horizon line a little bit, you know, get a little more drama out that, out that way, out yonder. All you East Coasters out there, this is what you're missing. Wide open skies, come visit. Or maybe you've seen it and you're like, ah, oh, it's too much space for me. I'd go nuts, couldn't do it. All right, so there's. And I'm just kind of smoothing it out a little bit. You don't have to smooth it out. I mean, if you like it kind of a little bit more gritty and, and less defined, um, that's something you can kind of make the decision about. Um, I'm gonna actually go over this right along the horizon. I don't really like that ribbon of white. It's a little bit too over the top. So I'm just gonna take it and go. Just really give it kind of a sense of, of deep space, a little fuzzy out on the horizon like that. It's kind of unifying a little bit. All right, I have myself a moody landscape. How about that? Maybe I do a little bit of this white kind of in You know, a little hint of maybe smoke or fog or mist or something kind of creeping in. Oh, I could go on and on, and I do. And this, and I mean, you can kind of see how how uh, this you could spend a whole day doing these and just kind of play around with it and and get different effects and um different kind of moods and things some of the some of the ones that i do are really kind of sunny and like they're they're in a, a riverbed or something like this so this is really kind of broad and wide open um others are a little bit more um actually i've got a couple sitting over here i want to show you some kind of finished ones so this is one that's a little bit more um 
I don't know, I, I guess you could say enclosed. Um, and the paint is a little bit rougher in there. Um, this one here, this is PG-13. If you've got any kids, you don't want to see a bare bottom. Prepare yourself. It's, it's nothing too extreme, but it's a figure. So this is one that's a little bit more worked and a little bit more colorful. Um, this one probably involved, you know, a stage like this. Um, and then I went to this and just started painting a little bit more thickly in here. And obviously the figure was done with a little bit more intricacy. Um, I did a, a, a preliminary, you know, sort of draw in of the figure and then I came in with the paint. So, you know, starting like this, um, starting, you know, with, with this approach here, um, you know, you can really make it as, as colorful or as monotone. I've got a couple of them that are just, that are just kind of like this, you know, the one that I did in the very beginning where I'm just kind of pushing things around. Um, and I, I kind of liked how I smooth things out there at the end. I'm going to do that a little bit here. So you, you really can kind of go in any direction that you, that you want to with these. Um, they're just really fun. And it, it's, it's often like, it, it takes the pressure off of, you know, having like a, this big, big mammoth project or something. These are just kind of fun in between little paintings. And you'll notice that as they, um, as they start to dry, um, there's, uh, there's a little bit of tackiness to it. So, you know, it sort of changes the way the paint moves over the surface. Okay. So that is sort of an introduction to alternate make mark making, you know, building a painting uh, kind of over time. Uh, but also these are really quick. So um, you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of options when you start playing around um, with, with this approach uh, to painting. So I'd like to spend the rest of the time, I of course always go a little bit longer than I always suspect I will. Um, so I'd like to spend the rest of the time just answering questions that people might have about this or about any of the other paintings um, that we've worked on in oils so far or any other medium if, uh, if they come up, so. So we do have a we, few already. Um, yep. It Great. looks like someone accidentally got water in their gamsel. So the question is, is it okay if the solvent or thinner mix with a bit of water? Um, you know, I have never had that happen. Um, the general rule is oil and water don't mix. Um, and I, I think what, actually will happen is if you let it sit, um, they separate. Um, and I think, how will it go? Which one will be on top of the other? But if, you, if you're able to separate them, um, that's probably the best thing. If, if as long as it's not a ton of water, you should be fine. Um, I really don't know the answer to that question. That's, that's never happened to me before and I've never encountered it. So um, my guess is though that they will separate and, and you might be able to, you know, blot most of the water off if, if it comes to the top. Although I think the oil will sit on top because that's chemically how it works, but don't quote me on that one. Okay. Let me know how it goes though. I'd be interested to hear the answer to that one. So um, John is asking, um, he wants to paint his guitar. So any tips on how he should prepare the guitar for paint? Oh yeah, that would be tough. It's because that's probably got like a varnish on it. Um, I'm guessing it's you know usually those things are treated. Um, how it, how attached to his guitar is he? <laughs> I guess would be the first question. Because um, if I'm going to paint anything that has already got something on it, um, I'm going to try and get that varnish off, um, or at the very least sand it, um, you know, take a little, uh, maybe probably start with like a hundred grit and just to break the surface up and then maybe go to a 220. Um, and then you could, um, you'd probably be better off using what's called an oil ground. Um, and you can find those, you could probably find those at Michael's. Um, but if they don't have it, there's lots of places that will have it. I think they do. I've actually been in there and I've, I've seen it around but I would treat it with an oil ground just to be safe. And then you can pretty much paint the paint right on top of it. Um, 
but yeah, that, that would be tricky. That would be tricky because it's, the problem is if it's got a varnish on top of it, you probably shouldn't paint the oil on there because it would, it would, it'll, it'll just start to peel off. It won't, it won't, it won't stick to the, to the surface. So you got to be careful about what's already on the, on the guitar. Wow. Two interesting questions I've actually never encountered before. <laughs> there's always new questions. Um, yeah, there's always new stuff. That's true. So would you put any sort of medium on at the end to protect the paint? Um, you can. Um, it's not necessary. Any painting that you see in a museum has probably got, if it's an oil painting, um, has probably got what's called varnish on it. And varnish um, back in the old days was Damar resin. Um, and Damar, I believe, is comes from, uh, I think it's called an acacia tree. I'm not sure, but it's a, it's a, it's a plant product. And um, what it does is it, is it sits on top of the painting and it forms this barrier. So if you ne ever need to kind of clean the painting later on when it's, you know, like when they do restorations of paintings in museums and stuff like that, they'll take the varnish off first and then they'll clean the surface of the painting, which usually if it's got a good varnish on it, won't be much cleaning at all because the varnish has done that. And then they'll re-varnish over top of it. Um, so a, a varnish of some sort. Today, they make a lot of synthetic ones. Just make sure that it's suited for oil painting. Um, they do have varnishes for acrylic painting. So, uh, you know, sort of pick, pick, your, pick your poison in terms of what, you, um, what you're varnishing. Just make sure it's appropriate for the, for the medium that you're using. Perfect. And what about um, starting over? Can you recycle oil projects? Um, so if I wanted to paint on this, if I didn't like it and I wanted to just sort of cover it and work on it again, I'm assuming that's what that means. I think um, so. Yeah. If you do that, um, you can put a, you can reground it, but don't put acrylic gesso over top of it. I mean, you can, if you're just practicing and you don't care about it, it'll probably be good for, you know, a few years. But if you care about the longevity of it, you probably should put an oil ground over top of it. Um, because once you've got the oil down, you don't want to put any water-based uh, uh, medium on top of oils, such as acrylics, uh, acrylic gesso, things like that. So make sure it's an oil ground. And then once you've got that down, you should be good uh, to continue painting uh, as before. Perfect. Um, how do you feel about palette, using palette knives? Um, I love palette knives. Actually, I've I'm sorry, I didn't use one on here. I'll, I'll go ahead and take this. Make some little marks with a palette knife. A little, I don't know, it's a little fence line or something like that. Yeah, I use them all the time. I just didn't use it in this particular one. But yeah, they work great. Perfect. And yep. what about, um, how would you go about painting and anything other than landscapes? Would you use the same techniques, like using a card as well? Or how would you go about that? Well, it really is, you kind of got to pick and choose. Um, like if I were doing, if, when I do figures like this, and I, that, that one that I showed you that had a figure in it, um, because it's a little bit more curvy and stuff, it's not so linear and geometric, I'll often use a, um, uh, a Q-tip. Um, or something that that has a little bit more uh, of a of a curve quality to it. You know these these things here um, really really don't allow for um, you know a lot of sort of sinuous little curvy stuff. So using something else, um, it's just a matter of getting the right materials. Some people I've seen use like um, you know those little uh, spongy makeup. Uh, you know, like you put on rouge or something like that, they'll use that to kind of draw away the paint. Um, so it's really anything that you can use um, to get the marks that you need to do. But, you know, this is not limited to just landscapes. That's a great question. Perfect. And um, can you use mineral spirits at home with ventilation or do you think it's safer not to? Um, 
I would have a dedicated space for it. Um, if you're using, um, like if you use what's called Gamsol, which is a, a gambling product, um, it's really odorless and the, the, the harmful fumes are really minimized. Um, there's another one called Terpenoid. Um, so those are best to use no matter where you use them. Um, but if you're gonna use them in, in a common space, um, just be sure that nobody, one has a allergic reaction because sometimes people just get really bothered by, you know, they get headaches by the fumes and stuff like that. Um, I would say you can, but just be very, very careful about asking people around you and, you know, making sure that you clean up well, so you don't get it in your food or anything like that. Um, you just have to be a little bit uh, cognizant of, of it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not like acrylics where everything's water-based and it doesn't have any smell. These, these will have a little bit of stink to them. Okay, perfect. And could you talk a little bit about um, cleanup and also what do you do with your oil rags? Yes, you, um, liquid. fantastic. I did, that is exactly how I wanted to end and we have a few minutes left. So that's perfect. perfect. I want to show you exactly how to clean these up. So it's been a long day of painting. I'm ready to clean up. Um, this is a great way to end things. Um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, do a, a full on cleanup demo here. I'm going to widen out so you can see everything that I'm doing. Um, make sure that you have a space uh, where you can put your cleanup materials uh, on. I do not use mineral spirits anymore to clean my brushes. Um, I just and it's not so much, uh, you know, that I don't I, you know, I, I don't. I do not use mineral spirits. It's just, I just don't feel the need to use them. And anytime that I can cut down solvents, I'm going to do it. Um, so what I use, just sitting off to the side here, um, just regular old canola oil, boring, regular salad oil. And that is going to be my main, and this is brand new because I just ran out of it. Um, does not have to be fancy. And as a matter of fact, it should not be fancy because the whole point is you're gonna use a fair amount of this. Um, you do not wanna use, I mean, you can, if you're you know, filthy rich and just can buy linseed oil, which costs you know, like 10 bucks a jar. This only costs like two bucks a jar and you get like three times as much. Um, so you just put a little bit out on your palette and, and you're gonna use it like you would um, mineral spirits. And all that means is you just put some down, pour it out like so. Uh, this, is, this is exactly how I do it. I just put a little bit on my palette and then I'm gonna just do my small brush here. And the first thing that I do is I wipe as much paint out as I can in my rag. So I just kind of go back and forth and back and forth just get as much out of there. Just keep an eye on it. And it's like, all right, there's not much left in there. And this is a really easy way to cut down in your cleanup time. Cause if you get most of it out like this, this minimizes what you have to do here. And then I just take a scoop of it and just go back and forth, rinse it out, back and forth. And I'm just looking for the color here to kind of get clearer. So it's still got a, a fair amount in. Now we're getting somewhere that's looking better. There's still some in there, but it's almost gone. And the thing is, you don't have to completely get rid of every drop at this stage because there's going to be one more stage. Like this is getting really close, but I'll try and get it so it's perfectly clear. That's looking pretty good. There's a little bit in there, but there's not much. So one, two, three, four different applications of the canola oil. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna sit this aside, do the same exact thing with my other brushes. And then when they're, when they're all clean, when they're all sort of clean to this standard, you know, like one, two, three, four, you know, they slowly get close to clear up here. Um, when I get them all done like that, I'm just gonna take them over to the sink, get a little hand soap or, you know, a cheap bar of like ivory soap and just kind of go back and forth a little bit, put a little bit in my in my hand and just go back and forth and do the same thing. And you'll find that it doesn't take long at all for it to get completely clean. 
and then you rinse it out again and you're done. And your brushes, turpentine is not good for the longevity of brushes. So, and oil doesn't really bother it. As long as you make sure that it doesn't stay on there, the oil is not gonna harm it uh, essentially at all. I've had brushes for 10 years. As long as I'm cleaning them thoroughly, they'll last. And um, this is my go-to way for cleaning uh, oil brushes. Canola oil and a little bit of soap and water at the end to finish it off. And that more or less brings us to the end. Maybe uh, as we're signing off here, there's a few people that maybe want to hold anything up that they managed to get out of this. Anybody got anything? Can have a look, see? Check. So we have, um, that is not Jason, but I will spotlight you. <laughs> hey. Hey, Jason. Oh, yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, let me see. We have oh, look, you some sticks or something in there as well, or back of a brush, something like that. Little yeah. wooden sticks, anything that you can kind of carve into works great. Oh, yeah. Well, full palette. Henry Excellent. Editor. Then we have nice. John Williams over here showing. Yes, us for the person, the person that asked about multicolors, this that question is being answered as we speak. It's got a lot of nice uh, sort of your primary, secondary palette in there. Nice. Thanks, John. Monica. That's great. Monica. Uh, Monica, yeah. A nice yeah. big dark hill in the background there. It looks great. Yeah. Marina. Marina. Oh, yeah. Nice. Hey, that looks familiar. I've seen that painting before. Looks <laughs> great. And I, great. oh, nice. wait, just one it's more. Got a nice glow. It's got a nice glow in the background there with that, that dab of white. Yeah. We have Leslie. Awesome. Ooh, Leslie. Yeah. Went full color. Yeah. Nice. I think that's it for today. Awesome. Those are great. Well, it was kind of a, a mixed bag of different things, but the, the, the working with the reductive stuff is really what I wanted to show you today. So I think we got a lot of that covered. So um, next time, I believe we will be working with, um, I'm going to be doing a portrait in oils. It's going to be a two-parter. So we'll start on uh, Tuesday and then finish up the following Tuesday. So that'll allow it plenty of time to dry um, and then we'll be able to finish that up. Don't be intimidated by um, the, you know, the subject matter. Portraiture can be one of those things that everybody runs for the hills for, but it's not anything that you can't do if you're, if you're willing to just sort of go for it and not attach too much, you know, I'm going to fail. It's going to be horrible. Don't worry about it. Just have fun. All right, folks, thank you again. That was awesome. And I really appreciate your time. And I hope to see you all on Tuesday. All right. Okay. Put the links in the bye -bye. chat for everyone. So please sign up for those and we'll see you then. Thank you so much, yep. Mike. Thanks, Amina. Bye. Bye-bye.